Our last artist before Picasso's Guernica, and that's Frida Kahlo by Diego Rivera, but an artist in her own right. She's interesting because she's the second generation who has uh, sometimes labeled as the second generation surrealist female. And remember, the surrealist was the first movement to welcome women into the ranks. But we feel, I think pretty strongly here, that Frida Kahlo would have painted this way whether surrealism existed or not. So it's not a direct influence of surrealism. This is Frida Kahlo painting her own reality. And as even Andre Breton recognized, Mexico is already surreal if it's magic realism. So she loves surprises. She loves to go beyond realism. And she will do that in fashioning her own myths, even though she was born here, the Demoiselle, saying she was born in 1910, because that makes her synonymous with the Mexican Revolution. She likes to say, I'm a daughter of the Revolution. I am the Revolution. But that's just her way of claiming her Mexican heritage. So I think we have to honor that and claim that as a movement, uh, Mexican modernism, Latin American modernism. Um, here we see the two Fridas after she's come home from being the toast of Paris, where Picasso has met her, Kandinsky, Duchamp. She's met all those people. Um, she comes home and Diego asks for a divorce because he's been sleeping with her sister. So she shows two Fridas, kind of broken hearted. And one represents her Native American mother, who was a native, Mexican native. Her father was the Hungarian descent um, of a German Jew. So teams Europe. So she puts herself in European costume, puts herself in native costume. She's held together by that heart. She cuts it right at the womb. Always showing you her physical and her psychic pain. Her outer actual pain. And she went to polio as a child, had a hurt leg at age six, and she went through that horrific uh, bus streetcar accident uh, when she was about 16, a uh, teenager. Um, so always full of physical pain, always also though very connected to her psychological inner pain. So inner and outer worlds, and look at the backdrop. Backdrop always seems to act out her own inner turmoil. Um, but here she is claiming her heritage in these, these works that are um, iconic. She's painting herself because she's her only model. She's in bed trying to recover. Um, and painting yourself definitely as um, uh, part of her national identity. This is a willful act of cultural self-definition. That's one of the points I wanted to make by looking at um, modernism as an expanded international language. These other cultures don't just receive it in a trickle-down way. They are in dialogue with it, and they change it. And they make something of it their own, and they change modernism in the course of it. So we have to think of the willful acts of cultural self-definition that goes on. This is the broken column, where this Greek column is holding her up, and you can see it's earthquake territory. The body in bits and pieces, and you also have to follow the tracks of her tears to get at her psychic pain, which is usually caused by the two accidents of her life. Uh, one was uh, Diego, she said, Mary Diego, and the other was that accident, that streetcar accident. And here, the wounded deer, this touching picture, you could say, hey, that's condensation. But I don't think she needed to read Freud to get the idea of doing this, the, uh, being trapped in the body with nowhere to go and someone, a hidden um, hunter, hunting you down and nowhere really to turn. Diego on my mind. So you can see things like Freudian dream logic at work. You can see parallels. But I think we need to understand um, that to label her a surrealist would allow Europe to colonize her. And that's what we don't want to do. And I don't think it's an accurate read. Finally, Picasso's Guernica, 1937. Um, think Demoiselle, 1907, and add those 30 years. You are on the brink. I would prefer you to try and get the date right, 1935, 37. 1940 puts us into World War I. This is a dress rehearsal for World War I. So the actual context for this work, this powerful work, is the Spanish Civil War, which we'll be talking about. And that is a prelude to World War I. Um, we have a lot of dictators going on in the world. We have, we got Roosevelt. We got the good end. Uh, but in Germany, they get Hitler in 1933. Um, and Mussolini is in Italy and Franco. Uh, uh, from, someone from the military right rises up and says, I'm willing to shoot half of Spain to achieve my objectives to rule the country. So a, a horrible civil war happens. Um, he's in Paris. 
He's sending money to help fight Franco. Uh, and uh, he has a major commission to do a major work of art for the Paris World's Fair. He doesn't know what he's going to do. Have you done this? Like, I don't know what I'm going to write my paper about. He hadn't even done anything. It's getting close to the time it's due. And then history gave him his subject. Uh, there was a bombing of a little town, Guernica, in the north region of Spain um, without any warning at all. Big fighter jet starts to move in. They fly over once. They don't do anything. The people get nervous. This was, by the way, market day. All the women and children were out. It's late afternoon. Peaceful day. Uh, and then without any warning at all, they start dropping saturated bombing down on this town. And they will continue to do so for about three and a half hours with no ability for anyone to fire a shot back. This is Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg means Total warfare. Forget trench warfare. Total warfare was Hitler's new definition of military warfare, and it means my people against your people. There are no civilians. It's not my army against your army. It's my people against your people. It's total justification for total blitz, total warfare, total annihilation. So this was their um, dress rehearsal because Hitler is actually behind this. He got Franco to agree to, he needed to test his new war machines. We need to test our pilots. So it's German pilots, ace pilots in German machines dressed up to be Spanish. And this wasn't even acknowledged until about 10 years ago. What we've known about for a long time is they flew over. Uh, and Franco allowed this. But what we're talking about is a cold, horrible war machine of 20th century technology and the atrocity of it all um, to, uh, to, to do this as just a test case. Um, so they were, they bombed the entire city. They chased peasants out into the fields. Um, this utter destruction, and then when it was over, Franco told people, oh, the people of, of Guernica bombed their own town. It's a communist did it. Uh, and they bombed their own town. And this is how the message went out. And Picasso was hearing from people who escaped, uh, who had come to Paris. He's got he's to do something for a world's fair. He's going to do something for the Spanish Republic in isolation that's fighting Franco. And this is the one time if art's going to speak, it needs to speak. right? So he's going to use everything he has in his book. He's going to use Cubist fragmentation to simulate the randomness of war and, and bombing and the body in bits and pieces. Because that's civil war, too. He's going to use expressionist angst, uh, and you feel it in, in some of the distortions and screens. This is a picture completely full of screens except for only one mouth, and that's the baby's mouth, which is all too silent. Um, he's going to use surrealist, kind of biomorphic or stretching. Um, and just kind of surrealist idea of an underlying disturbance that is at the heart of Guernica. So this is a picture of man's inhumanity to man. I tried to spell it out to you. The subject, man's inhumanity to man, the horrors of war. This is not a picture of victory. He didn't do it on the vertical, did he? Uh, the horrors of war uh, played out through a chorus of weeping women. And um, for this whole year, just like the demoiselle, 30 years earlier, he couldn't get him out of the system for a year. He cannot get this out of the system. He sends Garrett, he does the whole thing in like um, six weeks. Just goes to work, he doesn't do anything else. And it's a humongous picture that he sends to the Spanish pavilion at the World's Fair to try and point out the truth of what happened. Now notice, he doesn't do it with like German bombers. And that's what some people said, it's bad politics because you didn't spell it out. But he does it in a different kind of term of a massacre of the innocents. Uh, so we're going to talk about all of that. The styles, Cubist fragmentation, expressionist angst, surrealism, underlying disturbance. But it is, and I will try and show you, it is a picture of structured chaos. It's highly structured so that when you flip it, it doesn't work the same. It's really comes to a pinnacle. It's almost like a triptych. A sacred triptych, the center where this horse is being brought to its, its death, brought to its knees. And then this mother and child moment, which is a picture of rape. And this falling figure on fire. 
Um, or you can also see it as, can you see, a classical Greek temple. That's what's at stake. The foundations of society, of our humanism is at stake. That's why there's such outrage for it. Context then, that Spanish Civil War, a cold, harsh, machine approach to World War. Now, Guernica would be just one atrocity amongst how many wars, modern warfare. But because of this work, it has come to stand for something um, that is repeated all too often, that is transcended that particular moment. So we'll talk about it more. Um, it will be the way we bring the course to an end. If you want to read about it ahead of time, if you're a little nervous about it, Guernica is not in the course tutorial because it's always in the textbook, and that tutorial in the beginning was just for works that aren't in the book. But the weeping woman is, and that's how he, um, with the tracks of her tears and her screams, her sharp tongue. So if you want to get context for it, look up the weeping woman, and you can read about it there. All right, I hope that helps you out. Uh,